Yay, thank you very much. So we had already a, a very good practice run, so uh, this time we can amaze you even more. So that's good. Um, yeah, so welcome by, to the OWASP Security Knowledge Framework talk. Um, we are going to show and demo today the new features that we have in our dev branch uh, that we've been working on very hard. Uh, maybe do a small introduction of myself and Ricardo. Yeah, so basically what I want to start out with is just this talk does not really follow the format as what we would normally give our talk in. So, um, yeah. Uh, what are you hearing now? <laughs> I can hear you. Yeah, well, I hear myself echoing. Or my, not maybe, yeah, still. It's kind of annoying. Do you have the YouTube open of the live stream? <laughs> uh, actually, no. But who's clicking around? That's me. Oh, do you have the YouTube live stream open? Oh, well. So the thing is, this uh, talk doesn't really follow our normal format. So basically, what we want to do here is demo basically all the new beta features that we're working on. Um, so the beta feature, and uh, we will give some reference at the end of the talk, is basically all stored in our dev repo on our GitHub repository. So by all means, at the end of the talk, please uh, pull it, play around with it, see if you can break it at some point. And all feedback is very much appreciated. So a little background information uh, about me and Glenn. Uh, I am uh, Ricardo Tencate. I am CTO at Zerocopter. So uh, I spent the last 10 years doing secure code audits, penetration testing, automated vulnerability scans, integrating security test automation, CA, CICD pipelines. Uh, and I do a lot of coding. So that's basically me in a nutshell. So Glenn, please introduce yourself as well. Yeah, so I'm the security chapter leader of ING Belgium. Um, they are managing a, a big team of uh, penetration testers and, uh, yeah, as well doing uh, the whole security champion program uh, for Belgium. Nice. So basically, um, and <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, we do this talk like pretty much for five years now uh, since the launch of the security knowledge framework. So I think we did a lot of talks for, especially for the NL chapter. Everybody has seen our good old fashioned run by now, like, okay, how all the different steps in the SSDLC with uh, the training, the security requirements, having test automation for dead end code, over complex code, cyclomatic complexity to get rid of all or most flaws in business logic. Um, and then also the last part for manual verification and whatnot. We're not going to do this run today. Uh, we're going to do it uh, a little bit. So to, for people to, well, who see, I actually see this talk for the first, first time to give them a bit of context. So a bit of talks about static analysis tools and dynamic analysis tools and what the effective coverage is of these toolings. Well, as we all know, when you run your SOS and DOS tools, you generate a, a whole lot of false positives. Uh, well, here you see the OWASP benchmark project. So basically, they had an application, they benchmarked, they, they, they checked the results uh, to uh, a true positive rate versus false positive rate. As you can see here in the diagram, you have like, OK, tool reports, everything is vulnerable. Tool reports, vulnerabilities randomly. You have worse than random. You have your ideal vulnerability detection and whatnot, right? So take a mental snapshot of this picture. And now I will present you the current state of most tooling on the market that kind of looks like this. So what you see is there's a lot of tools who kind of hit the threshold of like better than guessing. Um, yeah, so that's kind of shit. And then we also have to take into consideration that most of the tools actually also cannot check for flaws in business logic, right? So they only check for uh, well, injection flaws, misconfiguration, and whatnot. Uh, but it totally missed like 50% of the attack service, which actually consists out of flaws in business logic. So uh, my favorite example here would be the insecure direct object reference, right? Where you have like the identifier. If you change the identifier, you see another person's information. 
if this is a vulnerability, yes or no, that really depends uh, on the context of the business logic of the application, right? So let's say, for instance, you have like, uh, I don't know, a dating app, and you change your identifier, you see another person's profile. This might be intended business logic because you really want to go through all the different profiles and see the personal information uh, to find out whether this person is a match for you, yes or no, right? But in the context of a medical application, this could actually be an issue where you could change an identifier as a normal user of the app and actually see like medical history and data uh, of another patient. So in this uh, context, it is a security vulnerability, right? So it all depends on the business logic of the application. Well, tools can really check that. So that brings us to our belief system. And our belief system, uh, the developers are really like the chosen ones, the NEOs, like they know all the context of the application. They make like really, um, um, big, uh, uh, I'm looking for the word, but I can't really find it. Well, they make really big impact, right? Because, you know, they have the full set of contacts. They build the features. They build those technology stacks, those complex applications. And, you know, they, they know way better how this application is working in, in, inside and out than ever a security engineer or a penetration tester could, could know, right? So that's why our belief system is really, you know, empowering those security engineers or those uh, developers basically to, you know, have that security awareness, have the knowledge about, you know, building secure applications by design, having the knowledge about using the right set of security requirements, uh, because that is the first step of, you know, doing security by design. And, uh, well, also in SKF, we, we build in, you know, we had labs, but uh, now we're going to show you a bit more about how it's integrated in SKF, because the more knowledge we shift to those developers about how to attack, how to verify vulnerabilities, and also what the design patterns are to, to solve them, yeah, they can do a way better job than any, you know, hacker or penetration tester uh, that could ever do. So we really look at developers as NEOs, right? The ones that, you know, have the full potential to really change the world, uh, but they're not really aware of it yet. And we want them to grow and become like, yeah, the ultimate NEO who really can, you know, make that impact in the organizations and, you know, build security by design. Yeah, so this is how we see the developers, really like uh, the NEOs who have all the contacts and we, we really want to focus on training them. Yeah. And that also brings us a bit, you know, like how, how did we came up here? Why are we ranting about NEO and, and, you know, false positives? Because, you know, in the profession that we do now for more than 10 years each, uh, we were always seeing the same type of coding mistakes. We always had like deja vu moments, you know, like, oh, another command uh, execution or a remote code execution or another SQL injection or another cross-site scripting. I mean, to be fair, if you are aware of the problem and you dived into it, you know, you know, what type of design patterns could stop this and solve these type of vulnerabilities. And yeah, it is not like rocket science, right? It's just very clear design pattern. You need to have the awareness that it can go wrong. You need to know the design pattern. And if you know that, you can prevent all these type of vulnerabilities. But actually what we saw in the last 10 years that we, you know, now 15 years ago, but what, what, what we encountered was always the same type of vulnerabilities. Uh, and that, that made us quite sad as well, because you as a, penetration tester as a you know an expert who wants to find cool and exciting stuff will always you know look for the xss and the sqls and try to find as many and it's quite time consuming and yeah all the really cool and advanced stuff uh you can you know you can't focus that much on it as you would like and that is a pity um and also when we try to look for information uh, you know, we found out that it's, uh, yeah, quite scattered. So we have the situation that, you know, like I say, a lot of coding mistakes. I see developers barely hanging on because, yeah, they do try. They have, of course, the good intention to write uh, good working code. But, 
yeah, because there's no clear guidance, no free good resources available. Um, yeah, they they struggle a lot, right? They are like trying to dodge these bullets, but yeah, we know that this is these developers are nails, right? So they don't have to dodge freaking bullets because they are nail, but they're not aware of it yet. So we were thinking like, okay, what can we do to, to help them, to guide them and to give them options to improve and really build secure applications by design. Um, so like five, six years ago, we created the project, uh, the security knowledge framework, Ricardo and myself. And basically it is, yeah, like I mentioned, the guide that, that those developers need how to do secure programming from the design point of view and not when you build the application, you've done a pen test, there are findings out of it. And then like, oh shit, let's, let's secure now the design that we created that was already insecure to start with, right? It takes a, a lot of time and resources and, you know, uh, delays in the release of your project. And maybe even it has big impact if your application get hacked. So our goal was to build like a security knowledge framework that would help and guide people, developers to do secure programming and to be able to do security by design. And to do that, it was all about security awareness, teaching them, learning them, making a, yeah, a learning platform for those developers that they can use in the whole process from A to Z, from learning uh, vulnerabilities by testing themselves so they could verify it, by understanding and having the right set of security requirements, by also having code examples that could guide them. Uh, yeah, this was our goal in the security knowledge framework. And of course, one of the most important things as well, to be clear and transparent. We wanted all this information to be open and freely for everybody to, to use and yeah, to be able to build you know, secure applications by design. And we said we were not going to do a rant, but um, the only thing I want to rant about is the importance of setting up the right security requirements. Because without this, you're really lost. You're on the sea, you know, with no guidance, no compass, and you're just, you know, floating on the sea and you have no idea where you're going to. So this is the most important thing to have set up. And what we did in the SKF project, we also used another great OWASP project, uh, MASVS and the ASVS. And this is basically like a, a building block, uh, like a good starting point for your security requirements. And as you can see, the ASVS has different type of levels for it. So if you just start, you use level one. If you have mission critical applications, you would use the level three. Um, yeah, and for, this is our project, what you see here, this security knowledge framework. Uh, we have like uh, the landing page. So the security knowledge framework is an Angular slash API application uh, that you can spin up locally with Docker Compose, or you can uh, deploy it with Kubernetes in the Google Kubernetes platform or Azure or whatever you want. So it is an application that you can use and where all type of sets of information and data is uh, available that we will, of course, demo a bit. Um, yeah, this is an example of the ASVS that was integrated. But the main thing here of SKF is you want to make all the threats visible up front by having the right set of security requirements. And yeah, then you build applications secure by design. So there are no surprises. Um, but what is important is, of course, to yeah take the responsibility and sort of taking the, the right choice to learn these new requirements because, you know, you, you're used to build in a certain way code, you know your design patterns. But when we talk about security, there are also design patterns to be learned. There is an investment, right, that you need to take. And this is yeah the, the choice that you have as a developer to put into and also maybe explain that to your organization, how important that is. Um, let's uh, indeed go to the demo. Ricardo is going to uh, start the security knowledge framework, the, the dev branch actually. So if you are interested in uh, what you see today with the new features that we built, uh, if you go to our GitHub project, you have the dev branch. And if you would check that out, then you can run Docker Compose uh, or deploy it in the cloud, what you want. And then you have actually all the functionality in the features 
that you will see now live in this demo as well. Uh, we are still testing it. So please, if you see problems or have feedback, uh, you know, uh, how we can improve it even further, uh, let us know because, uh, yeah, it's quite important uh, as it's uh, uh, still, yeah, beta. Um, but yeah, let's uh, have a look at the, the demo and see, uh, see how it goes. I think I actually already found the first problem. Ah, no, the database just uh, knocked out. Okay, perfect. Uh, so this is the security knowledge framework. So this is basically uh, what you see as you log in. So what you see is that we made, uh, well, you have your dashboard, the checklist, the knowledge base items, the code examples, and the labs. Uh, well, let's start off first with the knowledge base. So basically what we did, oh yeah, this is also another update. What we did was we created categories. Uh, because the, the ASPS was growing so large that we actually had to snip the checklist stuff in all the different topics that you have, like all the, the, the chapters. Uh, but this basically meant that we got a lot of checklists uh, and things didn't really become clear. So you can also add your own categories to put in your own knowledge base items to write your own code examples for and whatnot. Um, so this basically added an, another abstraction layer. So you can simply say like, oh yeah, we have web applications, mobile applications, but maybe also best practices for your Docker environments or for your cloud environments and whatnot. So you can easily add more uh, abstraction to the security knowledge framework. So one of the first things that I want to show is knowledge base. So like you already mentioned, we utilize the ASTS. Um, and what we basically did for each security control within the ASPS, uh, we wrote a knowledge base item. So you have more in-depth information uh, about the, the attack vector, the attack surface, uh, what is the attacker able to do whenever he's able to abuse this vulnerability, and also with a small solution to guide you already in the right direction on the steps that you should take uh, in order to mitigate it. So as you can see, well, this is really extensive because that ASPS is 280 security controls. We have almost full coverage at this point, not for all the items, but for a lot of them. Uh, yeah, well, this is an ongoing project, right? Uh, so we're still going into this and still uh, uh, improving, but we have a lot of coverage. So this is the first thing that I wanted to show because at some point we will create a new project and correlate uh, security requirements. This one is really important. Like I said, each control is correlated to a knowledge base item. Well, we also have uh, a good set of uh, code examples. So we have them like for ASP, Java, PHP, Floss, Django, Go, Ruby. Well, you can also easily filter them. And here you can, uh, well, get some more information about it and uh, look into them. So these are basically like the, the secure coding principles which are being shown through code examples for each language we have like around 30 to 40 code examples so let's get into business let's start a new project so let's call the project two bar blah i'm really inspiration at this point so we have our new project right so what you can do now is basically ask the security knowledge framework for requirements so you can first select your category to work with so let's say we're going to work on an application stack so we're going to choose web applications uh, then we're going to select the maturity, so how critical is your application, right? And according to that, you want to select the security level. Uh, then we can choose one of the topics. So let's say that you're uh, working on session management or access control, authentication, or you're going to build any type of feature. You can select the, the checklist from here. And basically, you can say from here, like, okay, what do you want to have? Well, we're just starting out, so we want to have the fundamental session uh, requirements. Uh, so there's no uh, token-based session management, but we're using cookie-based, so you can select that from there. Defenses against session management exploits, yes, please do that as well. Uh, we're going to uh, create a new sprint or a new feature. You can go either way. Well, this one we call blah, 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 because like I said, I'm really inspirationless. Uh, safe. And so basically what the security knowledge framework is going to do now, it's going to correlate. It's, both, it's basically an extra expert system, right? So we gave it the set of answers, and according to these answers, it's going to look through the ASCS, what items we need, uh, well, for this feature that we're building at this point. Uh, and now you actually see like, okay, now we have a set of security controls that we need to take into consideration with 
uh, when we're working on session management type of functions. So you already see like hey, the HTTP only attribute and you already see information about the secure attribute. So these are like basic things that you see missing uh, whenever you do a penetration test, you will most certainly always find like, oh yeah, missing uh, attributes for secure, missing attributes for HTTP only and whatnot. But here you already have like a fixed set of security requirements that you can already give to the developer. So ideally, uh, you take your, your team's uh, security champion or product owner or the tech lead, you let them sit together, define the security requirements, then the product owner can pick up these requirements and uh, put them uh, in the new story as acceptance criteria for security. Then from there, the requirements go to the software developers. The software developers make sure that they do the mitigations. And then ultimately, because it's also described, uh, well, as in your acceptance criteria for security, it will probably also come up uh, on, the, on the desk of your tester, right? So they will also write test cases for it, which can, you can then again utilize in CICD. So at some point, if somebody fills or mismerges and reintroduces a vulnerability that you already mitigated, well, your test suite will bring this up at this point, right? So this is the whole flow for setting up the security requirements. And I can imagine in a lot of contexts, you do not want to go from zero to 100 in one go, right? So you maybe want to build it up. Well, we also have a solution for that. So basically, you can manage your checklist. You can say from here, like, OK, I want to manage it. Let's go to session management verification requirements. Uh, and we're going to manage the questionnaire. So at some point, we chose, like, hey, we're going to do cookie-based session management, right? So if you say, like, at, at some point, I had a discussion with somebody who said, like, yeah, but we also have the reverse proxy who strips stuff. So it's really hard for us to introduce the secure attribute set because that would take a significant amount of effort, no problem, because you can then just easily remove uh, the, the questions that are correlated to or the controls who are correlated to the question, right? So you can really uh, set it up in a way that really fits you and your organization. Exactly, yeah. And th that is also the whole idea of the ASVS. Huh? They, they tell that themselves when you use the ASVS, they say use it as a, a starting point, like a template. Uh, and then, yeah, tinker and alter it. So this is the part from the security knowledge framework. You know, when you go to the expert system and you have the questions and based on the question and you say yes or no, it will include or exclude uh, one or multiple security controls. But for example, if we would go to the uh, manage checklist and we go to the checklist items, maybe Ricardo, you can show that as well. Yeah. So over here. So here we have the whole uh, category for the, the session management. And as you can see, you can add your own checklist in here uh, on top of the ASVS, or you can even say, no, uh, this item of the ASVS that is not applicable for me because we never use this technology stack, then you can simply remove it, right? So here you can fine tune the ASVS to your custom need or you can even say, you know what, I, I know better or it's so custom what I have. You can use this to build your own logic, your own expert system into the security knowledge framework. And as Ricardo already showed, it, it you know, when you have a huge subset of security controls with this expert system, you can very easily go from 300 controls only to like seven, like the one that is really needed. So you go from an, yeah, an audit-based control thing to a risk-based because you assess the risk of what controls you need based on the functionality or feature or sprint you are building things. So that is like a, a really cool feature that we now have in uh, SKF. So you can modify the checklist. You can build your own. Uh, what Ricardo said, it's nice and uh, very flexible. So this is indeed the, uh, the managed projects and the... Um, yeah, getting the right security requirements uh, for the people, uh, for the developers when you're programming. If you're programming sprints or programming features and releasing them, it, it both will fix uh, fit in, in this process that we defined. Uh, so that's really cool. And I think, Ricardo, I guess it's now time to move to the, to the, the latest cool thing that we did in SKF yeah. uh, and then demo that. Yeah, so basically what we did was, um, so the previous release of the security knowledge framework already had all the other good stuff, right? And also already the labs 
in terms of like, okay, we have uh, an overview of the different write-ups uh, and all the labs that we have, but you have to run the labs on your own local machine by either pulling the GitHub repository, which contains the labs, or um, uh, yeah. your machine uh, by means of Docker containers. But what we basically did now is uh, we built in the, the option to deploy the security knowledge, or the, the, sorry, the labs through the UI. So basically, you can go here, you can go in the labs, you simply press deploy. And there's nothing fancy going on at this point, also uh, UI-wise uh, and whatnot. Um, because it's beta, we are, we're building it. <laughs> but as soon as you push deploy, you see at some point, like, it calls you back, like, hey, I'm running on localhost on this port. So now when I go to localhost port, it might take some time because my internet is shit. We find here, like, hey, we have, like, here the, the lab for path traversal. Um, so back to secure knowledge framework. So you see here the lab. Uh, we deployed the lab for path traversal. Well, we can now try and test our skills on this lab. We can go to the write-up. We can follow the write-up, like, okay, so this is normally how you could run the app in Docker or in Python. Uh, but here is, like, the whole uh, list or, or the whole description, like, okay, how do I even recognize this? Where to look for it? What does your reconnaissance face? How could the code look like? Uh, what are the, so what uh, types of flaws in the code could introduce this type of flaw? And then also go through the exploitation phase, like, okay, if you find this vulnerability, how can you exploit it? So let's give another example. So now, for instance, we did path reversal, but we can also, for instance, select cross-site scripting. So we have to wait a couple of seconds. So now you see that it has been deployed on the new port. So we go here. Boom. Boom. So now here we have the lab for cross-site scripting, right? So this, you can find follow the write-up again, go through it. Well, again, you have the reconnaissance phase with screenshots, uh, examples, code examples, exploitation phase, which guide you step by step through how to effectively exploit this vulnerability. So this you can all do now through uh, security knowledge framework. So the cool thing is we don't all only have uh, the SKF labs in it at this point, because through the UI, you can also, for instance, deploy your other favorite stuff, right? Like for instance, Juice So now I click Juice you see it gets exposed on a different port. I go here. Boom, so now we also have Juice running. Exactly, and uh, yeah, big thanks. Uh to Bjorn for uh, doing this. Yeah, so we had some good calls with Bjorn, so how we could integrate this and whatnot. So uh, yeah, really awesome. So you can also deploy Juice Shop through SKF. And from there, you can also follow all his write-ups because Juice Shop also has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, nice write-ups. So you can follow that again and really use that for training. So the idea is you set up the requirements, you get the information to, uh, you need in order to mitigate it, and then from there, you can go to the uh, to the labs and really put your skills to the test. If you have built your feature, you now know how to test it because you had your test run, right? And also, by the way, for all the security knowledge framework write-ups, we also, again, give references back to uh, a web security testing guide. So uh, yeah, that has some more uh, elaborate uh, uh, write-up about so let's say we, we have a lab about uh, SQL injection. Well, the SQL injection that we have is only in the context of you have a Flask application with SQLite. But, uh, well, uh, Web Security Testing Guide really helps you into also uh, learn about uh, other databases, how your payload would look like, how it differs, uh, and all that good stuff, right? So that's why we try to reference the WSTG as much as possible. But what you, you really see in here is like we have a lot of stuff like, uh, well, course exploitations, we have insecure object deserialization, server side request forgery, tab uh, netting, uh, a lot of GraphQL stuff, JSON web tokens. Uh, I'm also uh, working now on uh, uh, some other good stuff. So this is really growing very rapidly. So yeah, so basically this is our new feature, the, the whole deployment of the labs. Um, so yeah, so this was the demo about security knowledge framework. Um, I want to give you a couple of more slides. Okay, if you want to set it up locally, you uh, clone uh, our uh, SKF Flask 
repository, do clone the, the dev branch, because it's at this point, it has been, everything has been merged in a dev branch. Uh, keep in mind that whenever you do at some point the Docker Compose, it grabs your few config files. So if you have like uh, set up that you are deploying shit to the cloud, um, yeah. <laughs> it will deploy it then in the cloud, yes. So the focus in your kube config of your kube CTL that should be on your local uh, Kubernetes desktop. Um, so make sure that yeah, when you start the Docker Compose, that yeah, you have it set up like that. Otherwise, it will deploy all the labs in yeah your your cloud platform that it was pointing to. Yeah. So um, that's really good to know. So in the, the Docker Compose, there's also other configurations that you can do, right? Like pointing uh, the, the instance to an external database uh, and setting all the, the secrets. So if you want to use it for production, you really have to provision uh, some secrets uh, at deployment. So you can all find that good stuff in the Docker Compose file. So what you can do is if you have Docker Desktop, you can set it up. On your local machine, you simply just have to enable Kubernetes supply and restart, and then you have the whole config file set up. Uh, if you don't have Docker Desktop because you're not working on either Linux or, uh, sorry, either Windows or Mac, uh, the alternative could be for Linux, I believe, something like Minikube. So after having setting everything up, you can run the Docker Compose, and then basically you have everything running. So how it looks under the hood is like, now you have your host machine, Docker desktop, we have an Nginx reverse proxy, uh, which uh, exposes uh, SKF to the outside world. It can communicate to Angular, to the API, but in the internal network is RabbitMQ. So RabbitMQ is basically used for, uh, as a job queue for all the deployments in the Kubernetes cluster, right? RabbitMQ has a worker that communicates to the Kubernetes API, which eventually uh, well, deploys all the labs on your Kubernetes instance. So uh, again, you have the SKF API. It calls the RabbitMQ server to create a deployment job. It's being put in the job queue. Then from there, the job queue sees if there's a worker uh, uh, at this uh, disposal to push the job to. The worker ultimately communicates through the Kubernetes API and deploys uh, the labs in your Kubernetes cluster. We have some. Uh, we have a good blog. I will post the link uh, in the chat uh, after the talk, so you can read through the blog and like read all the different uh, steps you need to take to set it up locally. Yeah, you still there? Yep, I'm still there. So uh, remember that I still wanted to do a small rant about security requirements and uh, yeah, why that was so important. Well, here you have the true cost of a defect um, according to like NIST and some websites that we found. And here is like the percentage or percentage, the uh, how the intensity goes up in what type of process you are. So relative uh, cost to fix the bug based on the time of detection. And as you see, the most cheapest thing is in the requirements phase. In the coding itself, you still are okay-ish, but it gets really nasty, you know, when you're in the exceptions testing or even in the production environment. And if we go to the next slide, what, uh, when we're talking about costs, what would those costs look like? Well, for example, if you find a software security bug in the gathering, like in the requirement phase, you know, adding that and defining it and making a story and make sure it's implemented in that sprint and doing the research about the security control to implement it correctly, like secure by design, will cost about $100. If you find this vulnerability, for example, or this bug in your Q&A testing, you are talking about around $1,500. Uh, and of course, when you find it in production, it's around 10000 and then you're wondering, like, yeah, why, why, for example, if you find something in production, is it 10,000? Well, you know, think about all the different teams and hands and, and departments this fix, yeah, needs to go to again, right? You have the developer who needs to gather the right requirements, build it, fix it, test it, release it, then penetration testing, security testing, secure code reviewing. So it passes all those different teams and squads eventually uh, to yeah verify again this thing. 
So this is only the amount of money you would lose and not even the impact that a certain vulnerability or bug could have on the system, right? So this is purely only for the whole release cycle. Um, so as you see, the, the more you are in the beginning, the more aware, the, the more you know trained you are, you can do proper security by design. And like I said, you guys, the developers are like NEOs. You know, you don't have to dodge bullets, right? You can simply stop them because that's how fucking awesome you guys are. So guys and girls, prepare for battle and become the security champion. Um, we have two type of uh, chat channels, as you can see. We have one on uh, Gitter uh, and we have one on Slack. Uh, you can also find these links when you go to our GitHub repository. They are like uh, badges, right, in the in the top of uh, the README page of the GitHub of the security knowledge framework. So if you click on them, you will also land on our uh, on our chat channels. And uh, yeah, if you have feedback or questions or you know you have some uh, some issues, uh, please drop by. We will always try to uh, troubleshoot and uh, and help. So um, yeah, then, uh, yeah. I want to thank you all very much for your attention and uh, listening to my half rant uh, together with my brother. And uh, yeah, we really hope you enjoyed the new uh, feature that we uh, demo to you guys. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, you know where to find us. <laughs> well, I'm going to ask one question though. Yeah. Uh, so say this, say somebody's inspired and says, "I want to help with security knowledge framework." What kind of help are you looking for? Uh, well, that's very broad. So basically, helping in writing knowledge base items. Uh, reviewing the code examples even help and enhance uh, uh, the front end because like you saw with the beta that we have like normally if you would press the deploy button you would like to see some sort of a spinning wheel until it's being deployed so at least you know that something is happening in the background right uh, but also in building features uh, doing security checks uh, yeah we can basically use all the help that we can get Exactly, yeah, and uh, well, and people who are more like in the uh, the offensive scene, like uh, you know, like to to do hacking and stuff. For them, I would say have a look at the labs. I mean, there we have like a good variety, but uh, I think there could be more added there. And you know, uh, just clone one of the labs that was already there, and you know, build your own type of vulnerability that you think is missing from the SKF labs. Write a write up for it, and we will publish it uh, as well, right? In the SKF, so everybody benefits from it. Um, so many, many things can be done. Uh, to be honest, uh, like content-wise, or feature improvement, or SKF labs, or yeah, uh, from every aspect, uh, help is very welcome. I uh, I would say. <laughs>